All right, welcome to episode number two in our Biology One ECA review series. And in this one, we're going to cover standard two, which deals about cellular structure. Now, we're not going to be going over every single organelle in this one, because um, I'm going to assume you remember studying your chapter seven menu, so you can go back and look at that. We're just going to hit some of the highlights that are mentioned in some of the standards. All right. Now, the core standard of this uh, standard number two is describe some features that are common to all cells and kind of learn what those things do. Now, if you'll remember, there are four things common to all cells. Now, what we're meaning by all cells is prokaryotic cells, which are bacteria, and eukaryotic cells, which are cells that have membrane-bound organelles and a nucleus. Now, both prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells are going to have a cell, also known as a plasma membrane. So you have a cell membrane and a plasma membrane. And the number one job of this is it's going to control what comes in and what comes out of the cell. All cells are also going to have DNA. DNA is the genetic material that's made out of nucleotides, and those nucleotides will have the bases adenine, cytosine, thymine, and guanine. And the arrangement of those bases gives you the code for how to make proteins. And proteins are made through a process called transcription and translation. All right. Uh, DNA is also what you would inherit from your parents so that you would know how to make these proteins. Now, once you have the instructions to make pro proteins, then you need the third uh, item that all cells have, and that's ribosomes. Ribosomes are cellular structures that are used to actually make the proteins in a process called translation. And then finally, you have a liquid component in the cell, and that's called cytosol. And in that cytosol, you're going to have the various proteins, ribosomes. If you're a eukaryotic cell, you're going to have the various organelles, and they're going to be embedded in that. So when you have stuff embedded inside the cytosol, that's what we call cytoplasm. So all types of cells have these four things. Now, standard 2.1 um, describes the common features to all cells in a little bit more detail. So let's go back over the cell or plasma membrane. Now, the plasma membrane is made up of two layers of phospholipids. That's why we call it a phospho or lipid bilayer. Now, there are different proteins embedded within this uh, lipid bilayer, and those proteins are going to perform special functions. Now, we're going to talk about that on the next slide, so I'm not going to bother with showing you a picture at this moment. Now, DNA, remember, it has that double helix uh, structure. Remember, double helix means twisted ladder. And the DNA is going to go through two processes, one called replication, where it makes a copy of itself uh, prior to uh, cell division, either meiosis or mitosis. And as you can see down here on this picture, this shows you replication. And remember, you have a replication fork. Uh, you're going to have a leading strand. You're going to have a lagging strand. And the lagging strand is going to be made up of Okazaki fragments, which will be sewn together by uh, ligase. And remember, it's the DNA helicase that's unzipping it. And we'll go over that in another video here in the future. Uh, transcription is the process where the DNA is transcribed into RNA. And in you know, purposes of making proteins, we're going to talk about mRNA here. So as you see over here in this other picture, uh, inside that nucleus, the DNA is unzipped a little bit. You've made an RNA copy. The RNA has then moved out into... Um, the cytoplasm where a ribosome is and that's where it can be making the protein through a process called translation and as you see down here on the third one a ribosome is a cellular structure that's going to use tRNA to help it read the mRNA so that it can make a protein and we're going to look at that in a little bit more detail coming up all right in standard b2.2 we're going to talk about the cell membrane in particular now remember it is made up of a phospholipid bilayer you have two layers of phospholipids. The polar heads are to the outside. The nonpolar tails are to the inside. Okay. Now, there are also going to be, essentially, and in, in general, three different types of proteins embedded into the membrane. Uh, you have channel proteins, which will act as a, uh, a tube that allows stuff to move in and out. Think of like a door or a pore. Um, marker proteins, which will have uh, carbohydrates attached to it. And those guys are going to be acting as like kind of a marker, kind of a, as an identification tag, all right? It identifies one cell as one type and another cell as another type. And then finally, you're gonna have receptor proteins. Receptor proteins are gonna receive chemicals. So a chemical is gonna to bond to it. That's gonna trigger a change in shape in that receptor molecule, and that's gonna trigger a cascade of proteins 
that will tell a cell to do something. So maybe a protein, or maybe, a, let me rephrase this, maybe a hormone will dock to that, and that's going to trigger the cell to do something. Okay, uh, I want to zoom in on this cell, right, or this picture down here. And as you can see right in this, this is a, um, uh, a, a protein channel. And as you can see, it's going to move stuff in and stuff could move out. Okay, this is one of those marker proteins. Actually, here's kind of a better picture back here. But this is that carbohydrate chain that can stick out. And that's going to be used as an identifier. Uh, now, this is called an integral protein, but we're going to, for our purposes, it's integral because it goes through both parts of the layer. But this surface right down here that's on the outside of the cell, maybe a molecule can come in and dock to it, and then that's going to trigger something to happen inside the cell. So that could be an example of our receptor protein. Right. Standard B2.3, this one asks you about what do mitochondria do. Now, you're only going to find mitochondria. I'll just rephrase this one. It's going to, it, it asks you to know what do mitochondria do, and it also asks you to know what chloroplasts do. Now, these two are kind of related. We're going to talk about these more in another standard about how energy um, uh, processes go on in the cell. But right now, we're just going to give you a little short synopsis. These are only found in eukaryotic cells because they are a membrane-bound organelle. Now, mitochondria are going to be found in both animal and in plant cells. And mitochondria are the powerhouse of the cell. It's the organelle that's going to make most of the ATP. And remember, ATP is your energy transfer molecule. In other words, think of uh, think of like glucose being a paycheck and mitochondria is the bank where that paycheck is transferred into cash and ATP is the cash so that when the cell wants to do some work it's going to spend the ATP like you're spending money to go buy something okay now over here in this picture I want you to pay attention to uh, a couple of parts here one being the matrix and then one being the Christie now the Christie are the folds of the inner membrane and this is where you're going to find the electron transport chain. And the electron transport chain is the part of the process that makes a ton of ATP. So you have all of these folds on this membrane, and that increases the surface area so that you can have more electron transport chains and therefore make more ATP. Now the matrix on the inside, this is where the Krebs cycle occurs. And the Krebs cycle is the part of the cellular respiration or aerobic respiration that um, produces carbon dioxide that you're going to breathe out. All right. Now let's move down here to the chloroplast. These guys are found only in plant cells because they're going to be doing the photosynthesis. And this is where photosynthesis occurs. So let's go down here in this picture. You've got a couple of main things. You have the thylakoid, which are these little green poker chips in here. And then you have the stroma, which is the liquid part going on out here. The thylakoids is where you find the light-dependent reaction. So we're going to call that LD for short. And then in the stroma, you're going to find the light independent reactions, which is where the sugar is actually made. Um, but this is also known as the Calvin cycle. So we're going to call this the CC. Now the light dependent reactions are going to absorb the energy from light and it's going to use that energy to run the Calvin cycle so that you can make your sugars. All right. So we'll talk about this in an upcoming video also. All right. Standard B2.4 deals with how does a ribosome do what it does. Now, Let's look over here in this picture. Uh, a ribosome is going to read the mRNA. So let's label up some of this stuff here. This molecule right there is mRNA. That was made during transcription. This is the ribosome itself. It has a large subunit and a small subunit. And then these guys right here, this is tRNA. And what's going to happen is these codons on the mRNA are going to match up with anti-codons on the tRNA. And once these two things are filled, so this here would be your P site and that would be your A site. The moment the P and the A site are filled, there's going to be a peptide bond right here. Now the moment that peptide bond is formed, this ribosome is going to click down one spot and this one's going to leave and another one's going to come in. Okay, This is much better to see this animated. So right now, I'm going to show you a video clip off of YouTube uh, from the Virtual Cell channel, and it's going to show this a little bit better than what I can. So enjoy, and I'll be right back. 
Translation initiation begins when the small subunit of the ribosome attaches to the cap and moves to the translation initiation site. tRNA is another key molecule. It contains an anticodon that is complementary to the mRNA codon to which it binds. The first mRNA codon is typically AUG. Attached to the end of the tRNA is the corresponding amino acid. Methionine corresponds to the AUG codon. The large subunit of the ribosome now binds to create the peptidyl, or P-site, and the amino acyl, or A-site. The first tRNA occupies the P-site. The second tRNA enters the A-site and is complementary to the second mRNA codon. The methionine is then transferred to the A-site amino acid, the first tRNA exits, the ribosome moves along the mRNA, and the next tRNA enters. These are the basic steps of elongation. As elongation continues, the growing peptide is continually transferred to the A-site tRNA, the ribosome moves along the mRNA, and new tRNAs enter. When a stop codon is encountered in the A-site, a release factor enters the A-site and translation is terminated. When termination is reached, the ribosome dissociates and the newly formed protein is released. All right, I hope you enjoyed that video clip of the ribosome, but we're going to move on to standard B.2.5, which goes, which we're actually going to deal with what are some of the protein structures found in a cell. And we're going to focus on these three. Uh, Flagella and cilia are related to each other. They're both made out of microtubules, and they're both used for cellular locomotion. So if you're a single-cell creature, this could help move you through your environment. All right, so let's look at flagella first. Flagella are very long, and there's typically only one, two, three, or four of them. And they're going to whip back and forth to move the cell through the environment. Now, cilia are much smaller, but there's going to be a lot more of them. So kind of think of like a ship that has a lot of oars, because that's how cilia works. So over here we have a picture of a paramecium, and as you can see, these little cilia sticking out, and they're going to beat back and forth and move this guy through the environment. So they're going to move it forward, or they're going to move it backwards. Now, some cells, like those that are found in your, in your, uh, your air cavities are going to have cilia to move stuff up and down. And so basically just to move things by the cell. Or maybe you could be a single cell creature or that's going to funnel stuff into your mouth. Okay, that's what some cilia are going to do. Now, membrane proteins, we've already talked about that a little bit on a previous slide. Uh, they're going to deal with communication. They're going to deal with identification. And they're also going to use with transport. So I'm going to look down here on uh, this picture down below. Okay, so right here we have transport uh, proteins where stuff is going to move in and out. So we got stuff moving in, we got stuff moving out. Okay, these are proteins that act like anchors. So if you're a multicellular creature, you need to make sure that your cells are going to be connected and stay together. So think of like bricks have to be glued together. Uh, these proteins are going to act like basically Velcro or connectors that keep it together. Okay, this is one of those receptor proteins in here. So as you can see here, the receptor molecule is in the, the receptor. Receptors change shape and that's gonna cause things to happen. Now, membranes are throughout your cells and they're gonna have often enzymes embedded in them. Okay, you're gonna see that in cellular respiration. You're also gonna see that during photosynthesis. And also in some of your smoothie yard, these enzymes are gonna break down some of the toxins that can get into your cell. So that gives you basically a nice little work surface for these molecules to be embedded. All right, and our final slide in this episode deals with the variety of different kinds of cells that you're going to find in a multicellular creature. And I focused on human cells in this instance because, you know, obviously we're humans. All right, so think of muscle cells. What kind of organelles would show up in your muscle cells? 
Well, obviously you would find ribosomes because you had to make the muscle proteins, your actin and myosin fibers, but you're also going to have lots of mitochondria because the mitochondria are going to supply the energy for those muscle cells to contract and move. Okay, So if you look over here in this picture, these little blue things in here are mitochondria and you're going to have bazillions of these uh, throughout every single muscle fiber. Okay. Now let's go to some of your digestive system. So let's think about the pancreas. The pancreas is an organ that's just underneath your liver and it's kind of on, just kind of behind your stomach. And it's gonna produce a lot of digestive enzymes. Now enzymes are made out of proteins.